Lord, you said your strength is made perfect in our weakness. And I pray, Lord, that you give strength this morning. I pray, Lord, for an anointing of the Holy Spirit. I must have you. I can't deliver this in my own strength. I ask you, O Lord, to come and do what you promised me you would do. You told me so clearly that there were hundreds of people going to be here this morning, overwhelmed, absolutely overwhelmed, loving you, <clears throat> worshiping you, uh, certainly your child, but overwhelmed, overwhelmed with problems, overwhelmed with all kinds of battles and strife. And, oh God, I pray for healing. Let everyone in this building hear me. Not me, but the words that I speak. And Lord, let there be unction and anointing. Not, not on how loud I preach. <clears throat> Lord, I won't be able to do that this morning, but I pray that the words would find a place in hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, Christians have, have many <clears throat> advantages over non-Christians. Many. But what would you think would probably be the number one advantage? One of the most advantageous advantages over a non-Christian, something that a non-Christian can't even know about, can't experience. What is the great advantage that you have as a believer over a non-believer? And I believe uh, beyond salvation itself, but I'm talking about being born again in the uh, service of the Lord. What is the great advantage that you and I have? And basically it's this. <clears throat> it's the supernatural comfort of the Holy Ghost. It's It's the wonderful experience of having Him come and convey and communicate the love of God into our hearts when we're going through very difficult times. There's a very powerful verse, don't turn there, but in Isaiah, it's Isaiah 66, 13, this incredible verse, as one whom his mother comforts, so will I comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. Jerusalem here being the church of Jesus Christ. He said, as a mother comforts her child. This is a, now we're talking about a devoted mother, not the kind of mothers who walk the street and drug addict and abandon their kids. I'm talking about a godly devoted mother. And the Bible, you know a godly devoted mother is especially attached to a child who is hurting. Especially attached in love and communion with a child that is in distress. What happens when a child goes down and has a fever and laid in bed? It gets all the attention and comfort. The mother becomes a nurse. And what happens when a mother has a child that fails and even is thrown in jail? If you go to, uh, when the jail has, jails, I think it's on Saturdays when they have visitation, you'll find mothers get on the bus and drive all night up to upper state New York and there's six and eight hours on that bus up and back. And here's a young man, see the committed murder. Somebody's, a son that's done something terrible, and that mother is there. She has cookies. She has every, she has a heart of love, and she'll step all night and minister, writes to him, prays for him. In the scripture, Isaiah the prophet said, as one whom his mother comforts, so will I comfort you. You shall be comforted. <clears throat> Folks, listen to me, please. You must know this about the Holy Ghost. About all some people know about the Holy Ghost, that He comes down and you speak with tongues. There is a ministry of the Holy Ghost. He's been sent to do a specific work. We've got to understand that work. He is a comforter. He has been sent to communicate the love of God and of Jesus Christ into our hearts. He has come to heal us. He's come to revive us. He's come to minister to us. And folks, you say, well, I don't, ha I don't, I have not spoken in tongues. But let me tell you, you cannot be saved without the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit that brings you to Jesus Christ. And there is a ministry of the Holy Spirit. There is a baptism, but there's a ministry of the Holy Spirit that is yours immediately upon receiving Jesus Christ. He is your comforter the moment you receive Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, this wonderful ministry of the Holy Spirit is, is marvelously <coughs> Uh, exemplified in Isaiah 57. Would you turn to Isaiah 57 with me, please? Now, folks, this message is meant by the Holy Spirit to bring comfort and strength to you and bring healing. So I want you to hear it in the Spirit this morning. Isaiah 57. Let's begin reading at verse 15. <clears throat> verse 15, Isaiah 57. This is about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is Holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, 
with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble. Now, this is the work of the Holy Spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, neither will I be always wroth or angry, for the spirit should fail before me in the souls which I have made. You know what God is saying? I have to send the Holy Ghost, and I have to bring comfort and revive my children, or they're going to just give up in despair. They can't go on. They will absolutely fail before me. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth or angry, and I smote him. In other words, the Lord said, here's, some, here's a brother or sister that's done wrong. He said, I chastened that one, and I had to chasten. I hid me for a season, was wroth, and he went on forwardly in the way of his heart. That means rebelliously. I've seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace be to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. Now look at me for just a moment, folks. Look at this person the prophet Isaiah is talking about and see if you fit into this place. God said, here's someone that sinned against light. Here's someone that went on rebelliously, forwardly in his life. In other words, rebelliously against the light, against the commandments of God. Here's somebody who knew better. And God said, for a season I was angry. And for a season I had to chasten my child. But he said, I have seen all of this. I have seen the rebellion. I have seen the failure. I have seen all that. And he says, yet I will heal. I will heal. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. I have seen your failure. I have seen what you have done. But I have come to heal you and I've come to restore. I have seen his ways. The Lord says, there's nothing hidden from my eyes. The Holy Spirit says, I know everything that you've done, every thought that you've thought, every failure that you have failed the Lord in. I know wherein you have grieved me. But he says, I've seen it all and yet I will heal you. I will speak peace, peace to your heart, and then I will lead you. I will lead you out of this place of bondage, out of this place of fear, and I will lead you on. I have seen his ways, and I will heal him, and I will restore comforts unto him. I will restore comfort. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the unconverted, now listen close to me too, please. The unconverted have no true source of comfort and consolation in their trial. The comfort of the Holy Spirit is limited exclusively to those who follow Jesus. It is not offered to the world in general. The Holy Spirit's work among the unconverted is to convict of sin. He will convict the world of sin because they've rejected Christ. That's not the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will convict and convince uh, Christians when they fail. But he does that only to heal. It is the work of the Holy Spirit to the ungodly to convict of sin of righteousness and of judgment. But the work of the Holy Spirit among his children is to comfort. And it's exclusively the right of only those who have given their lives completely. There is no offer of comfort to the ungodly. The ungodly have no place to turn. The philosophers... Now, there's something in nature that's instinct. Instinctively, when men hurt, they go for a prescription. They try to find something to heal. They, they want to alleviate their pain and their suffering. And automatically, the instinct is to go to any book, any tape, any philosophy, anything to try to alleviate. But folks, all of the philosophies have, have no other... They have no other a benefit than to diagnose the problem. Folks, you can pick up, pick up any of these how-to books and some of these pop, psychology, these pop psychology books and they will very clearly identify your problem. And you'll find yourself say, this is amazing, this man is reading my heart. Yet he, he'll identify, he'll, he'll say just what we've always known, that life is short, life is full of problems. And then, then they, they end up with all kinds of little useless cliches, useless formulas, how-tos, steps four, step five, step six. But folks, try to buy a book on loneliness written by some philosopher or some uh, expert in the human condition and try to find anything of lasting support. It doesn't work. It does not work. If any book was written on how to heal loneliness, it'd be the bestseller. The man would be a multimillionaire overnight. But it doesn't work. 
Folks, what, what a horrible thought, what a horrible condition to not have a comforter in a time of strife, in a time of, of overwhelming sense of lostness and sin, knowing that, that the mind cannot be uh, right with God. No comforter. And folks, think of the miracle that you and I enjoy. Think of the great blessing compared to those out in the world. You don't have to take a placebo. You don't have to take drugs. You don't have to be swallowing all kinds of pills. Now, I hope as a Christian you're not doing that. If you're doing that, you have not learned to lean on the comforter for your strength. But what a joy when you're overwhelmed and you need strength to have the Holy Spirit come and embrace you. The Holy Spirit, when you are down and afflicted as a servant of God, will not come to beat you down. He will not drive you further into the ground. That's not the work, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He was sent on a divine love mission. The Holy Spirit... Now, folks, please know that we are not united to the Holy Spirit. We're united to Christ. The Holy Spirit comes to abide as a personality, living and abiding in us, but not in union with us. He is other than us to bring us to Christ. Our union is always with Christ. The Holy Spirit has been sent by the Father and by the Son strictly to be a strength, a comforter. I, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to convey it to you like I, I hope to, but I've got some scriptures and I'll take you a little further into this if, as we go. <clears throat> the servants of Isaac dug some wells and the Philistines came along and strove over those wells. In fact, they strove to the point they took them over. They captured those wells and those wells were called Essek and Sitna and they both mean strife and hatred. Now, these wells had water in it. You could drink and be refreshed for a season. But there was there was no peace. There was nothing but strife and contention uh, pointed to those wells. Those who drink it, it could be temporarily satisfied. But they, they were connected with strife and hatred. And Isaac dug another well, a private well. And he called it Rehoboth. And Rehoboth was his own well and for his people. It, there was no striving over it. Philistines wanted nothing to do with it. No heathen can drink from it. No ungodly lips ever touched this water. And Isaac called it space or room. Space to grow and to expand in the presence of God. And Isaac, when he was thirsty, would go and be refreshed from this private well. And that's what the Bible says the Holy Ghost is in us, that private well springing up a living spring of water, of refreshment. And folks, we've got many, many people in philosophy and everyone else drinking from these wells, Essek and Sitna. And all it does is produce grief and strife and envy. There's no life in it. But the Holy Ghost comes to bring comfort. Hallelujah. He comes to bring strength to His children. We have our own private well called Rehoboth. And this private well, Rehoboth, is a spring of living water. He begins to spring up in your time of distress. He brings life. He brings strength. Hallelujah. He brings strength. How many have known what that's like to be so down, you wonder if you ever get up and suddenly the Holy Ghost comes and breathes on you and brings life and strength and anointing. The world doesn't have that. That's exclusively to God's people. And how thankful we ought to be for the Holy Ghost comfort that comes to strengthen us. <clears throat> now from the moment the Holy Ghost was poured out at Pentecost till the time Jesus comes is called the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. Now dispensation is strictly a period of time in which God reveals how He's going to govern in a particular way during that time set. In other words, from Pentecost, he said, I'm going to deal with you through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going on, but I'm sending the Holy Ghost and I'm going to work. You're in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. And this dispensation of the Holy Ghost is, is under the administration of a covenant that God made. He said, during the time of the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, this time set between Pentecost and the coming of the Lord, this set time, I'm revealing to you by covenant I'm going to work with you through the Holy Spirit in a very special way. And I'll show you that covenant, folks. And when you see that you have a covenant of the Holy Ghost, 
It's the most amazing thing because most of the pain caused among Christians is the fact that when I sin, the Holy Ghost may leave me. The Holy Ghost may flit away for a while because David said, uh, take not that Holy Spirit from me. And then two other occasions in the Old Testament, he hid himself uh, to test them and, and he hid himself because of sin on two other occasions. And so today we have the feeling that when we sin grievously against the Holy Spirit, especially when he's dealt with us about it. We have failed God. I am working on a message called the sin against the Holy Ghost, the unpardonable sin. How many have never heard a message on the unpardonable sin? Raise your hand, please. You've never heard a message on the unpardonable sin. How many have heard a message on the unpardonable sin? Just a few. I'm working on that hopefully for Tuesday night. I don't know, but I'm pretty well on the way on that because there's so many people who feel that they have sinned against the Holy Spirit in such a way that He would leave. Folks, under this new covenant, you can't pray, Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. And you can't say anything about His hiding because there's a covenant that He'll never leave us. Once He comes to the earth, He will never leave, never forsake. As long as you follow Christ, as long as you keep running back to Him, the Holy Spirit will not forsake you. He will not leave you. This is a covenant in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. I want you to see it. If you will, please. I want you to go to Isaiah 59. I want to show you the covenant that you and I are under right now. Folks, listen, before we read it, look this way for just a moment. Years ago, I worked under, I, I, I labored under an awful torment. It, it was just overwhelming. I wanted to please God so much. All my life, I've started preaching when I was just a child. I've not known anything else. He called me when I was eight years old. But when, I don't know, it started when I was about 18, 19 years of age. I don't know. I don't know if it's through some preaching of legalism or whatever it was. But I, I labored under a tormenting fear that if I should do something of a lustful nature, or I should fail God, I would be tempted. And if I fell into that temptation, God would take His Holy Spirit from me. He would take my anointing, He would take His favor, and I would be left to cry my way back into His favor. I would be left to work my way back. And I didn't know how long He'd stay away, but I thought He'd stay away to chasten me. He would stay away because I'd sinned against so much light. And I lived under that torment. It was the most tormenting thing. And occasionally, now, folks, the Lord has kept me He's kept me in a, in a wonderful way all these years. He's kept His hand upon me. He's kept me from iniquity. But I want to tell you, there was a torment for years and years. And we are tormented because of our ignorance. We're tormented because we don't have the light. It's the light. It's the truth that sets us free. And, and I lived on the early Pentecostal days. People lived under that. Folks, I preached some sermons that were, were frightening. And, they were fear-mongering messages. Now, I, I had, it sounded good, and there was truth in it, but it was based out of my own fears. I was preaching out of my own torment. I don't know how many people I put under bondage. The Lord knew my heart, and, and I'm sure He overruled that because I had a good heart toward Him. But, but I, there are some of you here this morning, you're laboring under that kind of fear. You said, well, I failed God over here, and the Lord warned me. And, and, and I know I've heard so much gospel preaching. I've had such good reproof. I've had so much light shed on me. So if I fail God now, how could He stay with me? How could God still love me? How could He comfort me in my time of failure? Or, or, or the terrible torment that comes. Folks, we never doubt God's power. We know God has power. We doubt His love in a time of of failure. We doubt that God loves us through these things. It's the love of God that we doubt. I've never doubted God's power, but I've often doubted His love for me when I failed Him. And I'll tell you, God had to come by His precious light. I've known about this covenant. <clears throat> when, when I was about 30 years of age, I, I came out of most of that because He gave me the 25th Psalm. Who is He that feareth the Lord? Him shall He teach the way He shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease. His seed shall inherit the earth. Folks, that seed meaning 
I didn't know then <clears throat> that I'd be writing a book or a number of books and that seed of the gospel preached spread all over the world. But the Lord said to me then, way back then, I will sh show him my covenant. The secret is the Lord with them that fear him and I will show them his co my covenant. And for years I sought that covenant. And folks, that covenant is right here. Listen to me, folks. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how you failed. I don't care what you've gone through. The Holy Ghost is under covenant never to leave you. He's there to comfort you. I've seen it all, he says. And yet I will heal him because I see, re I see godly sorrow. I see somebody that mourns over their sin. I'm not talking about the malicious sinner or, or the Christian who maliciously sins against God in pride and feels no remorse, feels no godly sorrow and goes on and hards the heart. Folks, that, that leads toward the unpardonable sin. But let's look at this covenant, verse 20 and 21. Isaiah 59. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, what? Shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Folks, the freedom comes when the light goes on and the gospel truth begins to, to break the bondage of fear. Fear has torment. God said, I'm not giving you the spirit of fear, but love and power and a sound mind. And I'm here to tell you now that you and I in this dispensation of the Holy Spirit are under a covenant that the Holy Spirit, once He's given to you, once He's given to you, He is there to comfort and strengthen to heal. I will revive you, He said. Now, folks, you say, well, why am I going through what I'm going through, Brother Dave? I love the Lord and I pray and I seek God. Why am I going through such temptation? Why am I going through so much trouble in my marriage, in my home? Why am I going through so much? Folks, the very word comforter presupposes that you're going to need comfort. That you're going to be in trouble. That you're going through hard times. Comforter suggests that you need comfort. It presupposes that you're going to have strife and difficulty. And in that difficulty and in that strife, you see, when Jesus walked this earth, His disciples could go to Him and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Well, He's in glory now. He's a man in glory. And He sent the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah! And He said, the Holy Ghost has come to bring you the love of the mother's love, according to the prophet Isaiah. That, and, and, and that's why... Paul could said, we came to you as a nurse. We nursed you because you was full of the Holy Ghost. And if you have the Holy Ghost in you, you will love one another. You will minister. Folks, listen to me. I want to tell you something about the grace of God. Adam sinned and brought his sin upon the whole human race. And God forgave him and restored him. You mean to tell me that God will have mercy on an Adam who brought his sin upon the whole human race? And he won't have mercy on you. I thank God for the Holy Ghost. That in my most difficult times, I just have to sit back and I exercise my faith. Folks, God never intended when you sin as a Christian to focus on your sin. You're to run to Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me. And then when the enemy comes in with guilt and condemnation and fear, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. You just have to say, Holy Spirit, come and embrace me now. Come, by covenant, you said you'd never leave me, you'd never forsake me. And if you live here, if you abide in me, I used to think that I'd sin, he'd leave me. He says, no. I will put my words in your mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, not out of the mouth of thy seed, nor the mouth of thy seed, seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forevermore. Your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, all the way till Jesus comes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <clears throat> if we're under an ironclad covenant that He will never leave us, that He will be here to comfort us until Jesus comes or until we die, why is it that so many Christians don't experience that comfort? They just don't experience it. Turn to Isaiah 40. And I'll show you the condition of many Christians today. Thank <laughs> you.
Just <coughs> water, please. <coughs> uh, David. <coughs> Isaiah 40, verse 27. Why sayest thou, O Jacob? Jacob's in the church. Why sayest thou, O church? And speaketh, O Israel. My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. In other words, Lord, I'm hurting and you're not answering me. You're not doing right by me. You're not doing justice with me. Excuse me. Lord, you're not working on my behalf. I just feel like I've been left to my own devices. You're not there. Why? Oh, Israel, do you say my words hid from the Lord? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary, there's no searching his understanding, but he giveth power to the faint, to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And I'll tell you why some of you, God bless your heart, why some of you have not yet experienced this comfort of the Holy Spirit. It's strictly because of unbelief. It's strictly because you've not allowed the Holy Ghost, you've not allowed your faith to reach out and claim this. Folks, if it's yours, why don't you claim it? Why don't you claim it right now? I claimed it this morning to have strength to come and preach this. And he's given me strength. I'm going to finish it. He's given strength. He's going to give you strength, whatever you're going through. It, the problem is we listen to the lies of the devil. You don't have to listen to these lies. The devil will come and say, you're never going to make it. You're never going to be the Christian you ought to be. You still... Too often fall back in your own ways. You're too lazy as a Christian. You don't read. You don't pray. Nothing but accusation. He'll accuse you before the Father night and day. And if you listen to those accusations, the Holy Spirit doesn't have time to come in. Folks, just stand up in your mind and say, Devil, you're a liar. The Holy Ghost abides in me. The Holy Spirit abides in me. <clears throat> Holy Spirit knows all about me. Holy Spirit knows my failings. But I bring him to Jesus and I confess him before the Lord. Then the Holy Ghost comes and he pours in comfort. He baptizes me in the love of Jesus. Hallelujah. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost which is given to us. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. The love of God is spread through our whole being by the Holy Ghost which has been given to us. If you allowed the love of God to be shed into your heart, some of you here this morning, and I know it, I know it, you're laboring under a sense that God is mad at you, and nothing can bring more terror, nothing can bring more fear, condemnation to think that somehow God's just not there because I, I have hurt Him, I've grieved Him. Now, folks, there is such a thing as grieving the Holy Spirit. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby we are sealed under the day of redemption. Grief is sadness of heart. Don't cause him the Holy Ghost sadness of heart. Folks, over the years, I know I've grieved him many, many times. I have caused him sadness of heart. But folks, the, the, the Holy Spirit, now listen closely. The Holy Spirit has come to comfort those who are most prone to grieve him. Did you hear me? He's come to comfort those who are most prone to grieve him. You say, boy, that's hard to accept. Well, go to Romans, the fifth chapter, please. <clears throat> Romans 5. I love this chapter, and I love this portion of Scripture especially, beginning at verse 6. Romans 5, verse 6. <clears throat> Look at me, please. I want you to raise your hand if you can say honestly, Pastor David, I know I am born again. And under the blood of Christ. Raise your hand, please. I'm born again and under the blood of Christ. Okay. How many of you can remember when you were not? What were you like? <clears throat> what were you like? 
Some of you, you'd have to, well, Brother Dave, I always believed he was real. I didn't hate him. But you didn't know him. Or you grieved him by running away from him. Didn't you? <coughs> well, let's read. Verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, means helpless, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love toward us in that when, <coughs> while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God said, look, I loved you even when you were turning away from me. I loved you back then. I convicted you. I sent the Holy Ghost to convict you. I brought you by my love. How much more are you reconciled now that you walk with me, now that I abide in you and the Holy Ghost abides in you? How much more now? If, if I went after you and gave you love and reconciled, give you reconciling ability, I gave you a reconciling place in me when you were a sinner, when you were out deep in sin, how much more now that you've come to Him? Hallelujah. You're reconciled to God. Folks, do you understand God's not mad at you? Some of you came into church this morning. In some way or another, I don't know how you would say it, there's, there was a heaviness. You brought a heaviness with you. When you got up this morning, there was a heaviness. A sense of failure. A sense of God not loving you as you think He should. And, and probably it is a result of some failure in your life. Something you did that grieved the Holy Spirit. But I want you to know, but that is the work. Folks, I couldn't have preached that until the Holy Spirit gave me the light. That He comes, even those who grieve Him, He comes, He comes to heal and revive and comfort those who grieved Him. Have you grieved the Holy Spirit? He said, I have seen it, yet I will heal Him and restore comforts to Him and lead Him. He's not left you. He's not forgotten to lead you. It's just that you don't see his work behind the scenes. God is still at work. God's doing marvelous things in your behalf and you can't see it. In the meantime, don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let him tell you you're going to hell. You're under the blood of Jesus Christ. The Holy Ghost abides. Let him comfort you. <clears throat> Folks, I want to leave time for ministry. The Holy Spirit told me today that he was going to lift burdens from the spirits of those in this service this morning. He's going to do it. He's never failed me. He's going to do it in the next 15 minutes. I want everybody in this church who's been under a burden. If you're here this morning, <clears throat> I'll tell you, why don't we just all stand? I don't want to isolate anybody. Folks, this has not been a profound message, just simple. <clears throat> it's only been uh, 30 minutes, 35 minutes. How many, though, are seeing what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. You're beginning to see the, the comforter is here. and he's, He wants to comfort you in your battle. Listen, if you know God's with you, if you know God loves you, and if you know the Holy Spirit's there to help you, that should be your strength. That's what brings hope. I know He loves me. He's not mad at me. He's here to help me and deliver me. I don't care what you're going through. God's going to deliver you this morning. He's not going to deliver you. He's going to do it in this service. Here's what we're going to do. First of all, give an invitation for those who have strayed from the Lord. You, I, honestly, you have strayed away from the Lord. And that's part of your problem. You've strayed. And it's brought such a despair to your heart. 
Maybe you don't even know the Lord. I want you to give you time. Step out of your seat. Come for prayer. <coughs> right now, up in the balcony, just go to stairs on either side and come down any aisle. Say, Brother Dave, I've strayed from the Lord. I'm not where I should be with Him. I want to get that right first. Get out of your seat and come right now. Can you... Look at me, please. Can you begin to understand how much He loves you? He loved you when you're out in the worst sin. When you're in total rebellion, He loved you. He sent His Holy Spirit after you. How much more did you come to repent, to reach out to Him? Pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, right from your heart. Jesus, I failed you. And I walked my own way. But I believe you're faithful. I believe you do love me. You've come to heal me. And revive me. And restore comfort to me. Give me a new heart. And a new mind. I believe you for that, Lord. And by faith, I receive it right now. Comfort me, Holy Spirit. And heal me. <coughs> by your heads. I've seen your hurt. I was there, and I've been there all the time, through your praises, through your failures. Never once did I think of leaving you, but my heart went after you. And though there were tears in my eyes, I cried after you and said, Come, my child, come. Back to his embrace, back to his love. I have not failed you. I have never failed you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you out this very moment. I'll bring you out to a place of peace and rest because you have cried for peace and you said, when does this battle and this struggle end? But I will end it today if you'll simply let me love you, if you'll let me embrace you, if you allow the Holy Spirit this very moment to bring the truth of His Word to your heart and reach out, you will be healed. You'll be strengthened. You will be revived. And you will have what you desire in Him. The peace and rest in the Holy Ghost. And joy in the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now here's what I want you to do. I want you, even if you're here for the first time, I want you to turn around and get in circle four, five, six. And as we pray for one another, the Lord's going to bring healing. He's going to bring power. He's going to be restoration. Come on, turn around up in the balcony wherever you are. Turn around. Take hands, three or four, five, six, maybe eight people. Get in a circle, please. Get in a circle. Break your way in. If you see somebody standing there, not in a circle, look around you. If you see anybody not in a circle, invite them in. Open up your circle. Let them in, please. Let them into your circle right now. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the message. 